Hello, and welcome to Differential Discussions. I'm Melissa. And I'm Dave. And today we're going to talk about the difference between reactive lymphs and monocytes. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> Bane of every technologist's existence. <laughs> this is probably one of the first big hurdles for me as a student, too, yeah. if I remember correctly. Absolutely. Yeah. As a new laboratorian trying to learn these cells. Yeah. It's tough. I, I think also like new employees learning diff struggle with this, too. Absolutely. Yeah. So let's talk about them. So I, what we're going to do is we're just going to go through some photos of these cells and talk about the differences, why it's a mono or why it's a reactive lymph and why it's not the other. And then I guess we'll summarize at the end the di major differences between the two cells that generally hold true because there's nothing that ever says always in <sighs> <laughs> That's a good point. I mean, there may even be some cases where professionals can kind of like disagree or whatever. On, yeah, uh, absolutely. On a call, so. Well, I think that's the other thing is, uh, you know, in the last presentation, we, we talked about neutrophil maturation, where we talked about bands and the controversy there. There's also with some with reactive lymphs. When is it a reactive lymph versus when is it not? True. Absolutely. Yeah, because some people can be really, really sensitive, right? Yeah. And, and maybe overcall reactive limbs. Yeah. And so when we talk about reactive limbs, we're talking about downy type reactive limbs that you find in infectious mononucleosis. Remember that when you talk about reactive limbs, there, there are two major kinds. There's the downy types. And then, there, of course, there's traditional reactive limbs that are going to become and look like plasma cells. So we're talking about the downy types. So just important to specify that. Sure. Okay, so let's let's take a look at our first picture. So lovely, lovely looking cell. Yep. Um, first thing I'll point out, nucleus shape, right? So things that kind of like stick out to me. I'm looking at the cytoplasm, the color. Um, not just that it's blue, but like the shade of blue, the shades of color I see. Uh, what else do you see, Melissa, with this cell? So it's got bluish, grayish color cytoplasm mm -hmm. it looks like it's hard to see but it looks like there might be a couple of vacuoles right in this area mm -hmm. right there mm -hmm. vacuoles are not unique to any particular cell although you more frequently will find them inside of monocytes than mm -hmm. other cells but they are not unique to monos right any cell can have a vacuum yep we've seen limbs with vacuoles plenty right. of them so yeah absolutely now that's the cytoplasm. The other thing, and this is not always true, but frequently with monocytes, when they interact with red cells that are around them, it looks like they're pushing the cells away rather than grabbing and pulling the cells closer. Mm. And if you look here, it kind of looks like it's, it's pushing those cells away rather than pulling. The other thing about that interaction is that the, the cytoplasm color of the mono is the same as the rest of the monocytic cytoplasm. And this is a big clue a lot of times. Yes. Again, doesn't always hold true, but the fact that it's not like a deep, rich blue there is giving us some kind of information here. Yep. Yep. Um, so yep. Melissa, what do we think? What do we, uh, although we got to talk about the nucleus, right? We talk about the nucleus, yeah. So. I think I already said that it's a mono though. <laughs> oh, shoot. <laughs> Um, so, I, I mean, other thing about the nucleus, the shape, right, um, the, the folds, right, yeah. I'm sensitive to those, yeah. and the chrominin pattern is kind of yeah. like a loose and lacy uh, kind of thing, too, so I'm paying attention to the chrominin pattern there, and really all of the, th the, the signals are telling me monocyte, as yeah. Melissa alluded yeah. to. And I think some books will tell you horseshoe shape is, is monos, yeah. although... Yeah. I don't know where that came from because <laughs> monos are not always horseshoe shape. I, you know, I, I mean, I would even argue that they're ra almost rarely yeah. horseshoe shape, uh, especially with as infrequent as you see them. You might see like two to five in a diff. Yeah. Um, and you, <laughs> none of them may have the uh, <laughs> have the horseshoe shape nucleus. So, um, you know, that's a nice thing, but honestly, I, I just it, throw that out in my opinion. Um, but. I agree. I don't think, I think pleomorphic. So like different yeah, shapes yeah. to the nucleus is more specific to the mono than the horseshoe. I would tend to agree. All right. But yeah. So. I think all of those things together. So we notice how we didn't just go, hmm, because it's a horseshoe, it's a mono. Yeah. 
we right. we kind of went through the whole thing so i think really when you're evaluating models especially in the beginning you kind of have to have a checklist in your head of how does it look when it's interacting what does the cytoplasm look like what's the shape of the nucleus i think you have to have kind of this big checklist throughout your head so that you can say it's a mono yep yep Look, it's nice when all the evidence goes to one side yep. and it's the call a lot easier, but you'll see as we move through this, we're going to have a push and a pull here. Yep. And, and so yep. um, that's the, the difficulty. Yep. All right, next. <clears throat> next. Cool. So we're not going to focus on the upper cell, right? That looks just like a lymph. Small round uh, resting. Yep, boring old lymph. Yep. But what's going on in the uh, bottom left? Mm -hmm. um, so I see a prominent vacuole. Yep. Uh, I see a, a lobed nucleus. There's like multiple like lobes. Yep. Uh, cytoplasm's got a blue gray character to it, and it is interacting with a red cell. Um, and I don't see anything especially that stands out about it. No. Um, so this one's sending me signals that it's a particular thing. How do you feel about this particular cell? I feel the same way. It's, it's, yeah. it's leaning towards one direction. Yep. The segmenting is interesting. Monos don't always segment. So when it segments like this, students can easily confuse it with neutrophils. Mm -hmm. But again, if you look at the cytoplasm, it's not a pinky purpley kind of color. It's right. blue gray. And it's not granular in the way that neutrophils are but this model you can actually see that it does have some granules especially in this area but this looks almost um the textbooks will describe it as like ground glass appearance the other one that i like is sandy it almost looks like you threw sand in there mm -hmm. and that's what it, it looks more sandy it's more fine the granulation that you see in these monos when you can see it because you can't always really see the the granulation to the monos right. so i think that the this is a a nice example because it's a mono that's segmented it almost looks more neutrophilic because mm -hmm. of the segments mm -hmm. than reactive lymphy mm -hmm. yeah monos do what they want they, <laughs> they do yeah, but again, it's that checklist. You have to have all of the things together, not just their segments so it's a neutrophil. Yeah, yeah. You have to have all the checklists in your head. All right, next cool. one. Yep. <laughs> okay, so some things we're starting to see um, with this particular cell. So, uh, I'm going to skip a little bit and talk about it interacting with the red cells. Um, so remember, we said the monos tend to push. This doesn't look as much like a push that's going on. We're also seeing the coloration near that interaction with the red cell, a deeper uh, blue. Um, that's a clue. We see vacuoles. So I see some vacuoles in there. Um, the nucleus has got kind of a weird shape i guess um it's but kind of doing this and then it's indented here yeah yeah so it's got a little bit of a an odd shape yep. um and then i also see i'm looking at the chrominin on this cell too i'm trying to pay real close attention to the chrominin and i see some areas in the middle there that are really really deep dark clumps heavy clumping uh, so this is going to be a really tricky call i think for a lot of uh a lot of uh, new grads. Um, any other details that you'd like to point out before we talk more? No. Um, so, you know, womp, 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 right? So <laughs> uh, for those following along that might be guessing um, what this might be, this looks pretty reactive to me. Okay, I think it's a mono. This is a mono? I oh. think it's a mono, yeah. I always call this one a mono. And the reason why I call this one, if, when I go to the next one, you'll, you'll see why. Because this one is great because of the grabbing, because mm. of the blue. But for me, the blue doesn't radiate enough. Yeah, it's not as deep and dark. So this is our rule-breaking cell, we yep. might say. Yeah, and he is. And the other thing, because he's bent all the way down here, like he has this indent all the way down there, I don't know that I've seen a reactive indent like that. 
that would be truly unusual for a lymph to yeah. do um yeah. yeah if anything lymphs cleft or mm. if you get to like where they have lobes then you're talking to like cesary cells and we're not sure. there we're just talking about like monos and reactive so this one looks more mono-y and you're right this one does have some nice deep dark clumping right here yeah but if you look like this right here specifically it looks like a nice lacy pattern to me true and then it looks like there's some lacy patterns in here and for those of you that are watching and are like what the hell is lacy when we talk about lacy all we mean are like I think of it always as like very fine white lines that go through. And I always think of them as like little teeny squiggles. So they're not like perfect lines. They're kind of like, I don't know, just like kind of squiggly lines that go through, but they're nice and light. Like they're not super prominent breaking through. Occasionally they are. I, I felt like the last mono we looked at had a more white prominent striations mm. than this one, but some of them will, but it just all depends on the pattern. But yeah, no, I think this one's more mono. But see, this is why these are tricky. They can look yeah. really reactive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, you know, we look at these, we look at these every year, actually. <laughs> yep. And in, and in class, I made the call uh, mono. And then here on stream, I'm just like, mm. and, and, and it's, it's the push and pull. It really is. Um, it's the push and pull. Um, but yeah, I think I, I tend to agree with you. Um, well, let me show you the next cell. Much easier for me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so this cell really just kind of shows you the difference between the last one and this one. I think everyone can agree that this one just looks angry. This is actually kind of um, highlighting another point too. There's a little bit of an NC ratio issue with this cell, right? And so I think what makes this a lot easier for me to kind of uh, look at and work with, uh, monos will almost never, in my experience, achieve an NC ratio like this. There is a lot of nucleus for the monocytoplasm that's available. Um, things, yeah, the angriness. So the nucleoli, there's what, four prominent ones here? Well, there's two really prominent that look like eyeballs looking at you. There's yeah. one right there. <laughs> right there. And so we talked about nucleoli a little bit uh, in the neutrophil maturation, uh, what it means for the cell metabolically. It, it's doing things, right? So like the DNA is actively being used to do something to accomplish the task of the cell. So um, monos can definitely have like nucleoli remnants maybe, um, but to have this many would be sort of unusual, um, but certainly consistent with a reactive lymph. Yeah. Um, and then, so this is doing that rate, you talked about radiating, like the color radiating. You wanna yeah. expound on that a little bit? Yeah, so like if you look here, see how this dark blue at the edge, just like the mono, the last mono we, we looked at, but notice how it radiates inwards. And what I mean is it kind of shades. So you go from deep dark blue to a lighter shade, lighter shade, lighter shade until you're at the shade of the cytoplasm. Hmm. And that shading is really characteristic of reactive lymphs. And you'll see that in some of the other reactive lymphs that where we can actually see a little bit more cytoplasm where it's interacting, you'll really see that radiating of the, the dark blue color inwards from dark blue to a lighter blue as it moves in. Mm. The other thing with these cells is remember small round resting limbs are nice and like this. When you take reactive lymphocytes, it's almost like all you're doing is taking the nucleus and stretching it. This nucleus looks stretched and you can really see prominent white striations in the, the nucleus and the, between those two nucleoli, those white striations and the deep dark blue, it makes the cell look really angry. Mm -hmm. Can we look back at the, uh, the mono from the previous one too? So we're talking about that blue. So see, this is where this particular cell has that dark blue, but it just isn't bleeding down in. It's not as rich. Um, oh, cool. That's oh, good no. idea. <laughs> yeah and, and it's it's at the top of this reactive lymph on the right that's just very unusual so like the mono on the left the rule breaker that tricked me right um 
there, there's just it doesn't move much from the uh, the the edge of the cytoplasm there. Um, yeah. yeah, these guys are like actively the reactive lymph. Those those projections are actively stretching to grab. Right. right. Yep. 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 Okay, next one. Yeah, sure. <laughs> it gets a little easier. <laughs> well, when we look at it together, everyone will be like, oh yeah, okay, that makes sense. I can do it. And then when you start looking at them, you're on your own. You're like, <laughs> so just the, the more experience you get looking at these cells, the easier it becomes. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's some, so we have two cells, I think, worthy of talking about in this one field. One of them's kind of off, uh, yeah. off a little bit. Um, so I think the color in the cell in the top left is just exquisite. Yeah. There is very little doubt in my mind that that's a reactive lymph. Mm -hmm. Looking at the blue in the bottom of the cytoplasm and how it changes as you move through the cytoplasm. And it just radiates to a lighter color and then that's... dark blue radiating. Yep, really... perfect. Yeah. It has a vacuole right there. It does. It does. Yep. And then so does uh, its friends, right? Yeah, so this, this is another reactive lymph. Yeah. And, it, and it, in fact, has a vacuole. Yep. Um, other things to note, too, that stretchy phenomena is like pretty prominent here, right? Like a mono generally, um, it can be pseudopod like and kind of be a little handsy, but these are really irregular pseudopods, right? And pseudopods, I mean to say the cytoplasm kind of extending. Like this, like this mm -hmm. extension here. Yeah. Um, that, it's just weird. Uh, it, you know, um, I'm looking at NC ratio a bit too on these cells. Yep. Yeah. And also the cytoplasm isn't sandy in the way that it's granular. There's some mm -hmm. granules, like this guy's got some in there, mm -hmm. but they're just regular xerophilic granules that limbs have right they're not, not the really grit. yeah they're not gritty like the sandy one in the mono mm. yeah yeah so two reactives right the other thing is that their nucleus isn't doing interesting things it's mostly stretching yeah yeah okay. but it has vacuoles yep vacuoles. So, vacuoles are not unique and the rules break both ways right yep. like this is where yeah mm -hmm. yep and then just for reference, this is a, a small round resting lump. Yep. Boring. <laughs> All right, ready? Next. Mm. So this one is, um, I think has less of the stretchy, like blaring horn of the the reactive lymph but still a lot of great um reactive lymph qualities with the color again right this is where that yeah that blue um is just telltale this deep dark blue here mm -hmm. around this edge over here mm -hmm. and i know there's not a lot of cytoplasm at the top there but you even still there that's just yeah. uh just screaming reactive lymph and, and the nucleus it's still Remember, small round resting limbs, their nucleus is about the same size as the red cells around them. So the nucleus is still stretched. Definitely. It's just not stretched in the way that some of the other reactive limbs are. And right. you, so you can see there's still really prominent white striations throughout this nucleus, even though it's not huge like the other ones were. All right, yeah. one more for you before we summarize. Drum roll. Yeah. Yeah, you made these easy for me. So <laughs> these are like this one's like one of my favorite pictures. This one and the first reactive that we saw are some of my favorites. I mean, talk about stretchy. This one's coming down and around that red cell on the bottom there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's awesome. Yeah. That's literally grabbing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> very, very grabby. Yeah. Um, great blue. You mm -hmm. have the 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 spectrum of blue that yep. radiates out from the edge there. Nucleus, very, very stretched. Um, this fellow checks all the boxes for reactive lymph. Yep, he does. All right, well, let's summarize. Mm -hmm. So when you're comparing a reactive lymph to a mono, you really want to compare the cytoplasm. Mm. 
So the cytoplasm of that reactive lymph generally has that quality where it has the deep dark blue at the edges that radiates in to a lighter color blue. And it's not granular in the way that monocytoplasm is granular and gritty kind of looking like you see here because they have that sandy appearance or ground glass appearance to their cytoplasm. And then we have nuclear shape. Mm. So the nuclear yeah. shape is gonna be, you know, the, nu the nucleus of that reactive isn't gonna do fun things. Right. It's gonna stretch. Right. Versus something like this. You can get some optical illusions of, uh, mm -hmm. but but you're right. If you're really really closely paying attention, you can see that stretchiness. Whereas the mono will almost never, right? I mean, almost never have that uh, that kind of stretch though. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And the the mono nucleus is pleomorphic, so it'll make these weird shapes and right. do these odd things. You can even look segmented sometimes. Mm -hmm. And then chromatin pattern. Yeah chronin pattern it's going to be clumped in the lymph although uh, but you know when it stretches that's you have to understand what that's going to do to the color and the density of the of the purple yep. um where it, it can be stretched out be lighter shade than it would have been if it was a resting lymph but still not have the character of a, of a mono yeah and the prominent white striations, usually yes, reactive right. lumps have really prominent. I always do this because I think just like scratch marks, you know, <laughs> on like a chalkboard, a terrible sound, but like good visual kind of thing. Sure. Whereas the monos have the lacy pattern. And then interactions with red cells. <clears throat> This is the one where that I got fooled, <laughs> which was, I think is actually kind of nice that uh, I got tricked. Um, Th this stuff isn't easy. No. Um, and even if I have a couple cobwebs um, uh, in my brain when I do this video, you, you know, you can make a mistake in judgment. Yeah. Um, and the, the interaction with red cells is a good thing to look for. It can bite you a little bit. I think this, the way you structured this here, cytoplasm, nuclear shape, and chroma pattern, and then the interaction with red cells is really appropriate for doing the decision making between the two, right? And normally, as instructors, you're going to hear us talk about nuclear shape, chromatin pattern, ad nauseum. And I think it's because it's one of the harder skills to develop as a morphologist. Especially chromatin. And it's so important to what we do. But this is one of those cases where, you know what, the cytoplasm is kind of the most helpful, isn't it? Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I think you would just have to get used to monocytic versus reactive. Mm the nuclear patterns, which takes, I feel like even longer. It does. Cause I mean, how many monos do you see, yeah. right? You don't see a ton of them and, you know, coming out of doing normals, you're not going to see a lot of reactive limbs. Yeah. And, and so, you know, I think that's where a lot of this comes from, but yeah. cool. Absolutely. All right. Well, I think that's all we have for, for this video. So thanks for watching. Thanks for watching me get a call wrong. <laughs>